Rob, my brother, welcome to the Superhuman Life, man. How's it going? It's going great, Frank. Looking forward to talking to you. Yeah, really, really excited, man. We just wrapped it up. I mean, we, we should have hit record 15 minutes ago because I, <laughs> I, hopefully we can get some of that uh, in, this, in this episode. But um, like so many of our guests, you wrote a book. And we're going to get to that book here. And, and that's really, we're going to dive deep into your mission and, and really, you know, what you're doing and what you're all about and, and how God's working in your life. But you know, I think the real power is, is in kind of in people's journeys and, and in their stories. You know, I think as, um, as listeners of this episode, that's, they, they, they've obviously, that's, that's what they come here for is they want to hear how people have been able to transform and how they've been able to turn their life around. So before we kind of get into, you know, what you're doing in, in, in the, you know, the real content of the book and, and why it's important to wait both from a practical standpoint, because I love your approach practically, um, but I want to get into some of the Christian stuff as well, because um, obviously that's a big part, a big part of our show. But before we get into that, let's hear, you know, let's hear the story of, of how this all came. I mean, take us back to, to little yeah. Rob, uh, you know, the, the, the little guy growing up in Baltimore there. And, yeah. And, 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 and through this, you know, there's going to be some times where I maybe kind of chime in and, you know, we're going to pull out some real actionable points. Uh, but I'm just going to open it up here for you and, 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 and kind of share with us how you got to this point where you're now this, this amazing author and you're, you're sharing this message of the importance of, of waiting for marriage. Um, and yeah, let's just, let's just hear the, sure. let's just hear the beginning. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so my, I was born and raised in Baltimore. It's where I'm at right now. And uh, my mom got pregnant with me young. She was, she was 14 when her, my dad knocked her up. He was 16. Um, but they actually married, but they separated when I was like 10 months old. So they I married was, at 16 and 14. I think she may have been 15 and okay. yet, at that point, but yeah, they married young. And my mom, my grandmother was a Baptist, a strict Baptist. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it was a shotgun wedding, but, it might have been. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, for the most part, I, my mom raised me with an eighth grade education and my dad was never in the same state. He never paid child support. So I didn't see him very often. So I didn't have like a, a strong male role model around mm. and, you know, I just kind of figured out like how to be a man on my own. So I watched television and movies and, you know, my mom had a few different boyfriends and I there was a kind of sexual environment that I was raised in as far as like just people in the house. And so from the time I was 15 years old, around 15 is when I hit puberty, I guess. But I remember I found a videotape of my mom's <clears throat> that she, she and her friends had rented and it was of male strippers. And I remember looking at the television thinking that's what I want to be when I grow up. Like, so I don't know where it even came from, but for some reason I wanted to be a stripper when I, from the time of about 15. And uh, when I was 19 years old, I achieved that dream. Mm. I started working for an entertainment agency in Baltimore and I eventually went on to work for all of them. And I was like the number one guy in Baltimore. I was in the phone book and I was, you know, working with the mail review and, and I was having a lot of sex, a lot, a lot of casual sex. And, um, you know, kind of liked being me, to be honest, if life was easy. It was a party. I'd created this persona of, of, you know, Rob, you know, I transitioned into nightclub promoting when I was about 25 and I started running the nightlife in Baltimore and I was, I was making a lot of money just partying, you know, like mm -hmm. life was a party. And, um, when I was 27 years old, as I just shared with you a minute ago, I was in Cancun, Mexico with some friends on spring break and I got baptized in the Holy spirit. Like all of a sudden I became really aware that Jesus was who he said he was and that he had a plan for my life. And I was like, Oh shit basically this, this changes everything, you know, cause up until then I, my whole philosophy on life was, you know, YOLO for the most part, mm -hmm. that was before YOLO was around, but you know, it was like, Hey, look, we're going to die one day. Let's just have as much fun as possible. And all of a sudden now I was like, Whoa, you don't just die now. What? So I, I quit stripping. I quit promoting. I broke up with my, my hot girlfriend and you know, I'd been cheating on <clears throat> and um, started going to church, man. I started reading the word and um, trying to figure out, you know, learn about this God that I really didn't know anything about. And I liked, I liked the things that I was learning and I was, but it was at the same time, I got really lonely quickly because all of a sudden I, you know, I had to cut off all. So some people, if they become a Christian, they have to make some changes. I mean, most people have to make changes. Mm -hmm. I had to change everything. I mean, I had to change my career. I had to 
change all my friends. I had to like adopt a completely different lifestyle that was foreign to me. And, you know, I was going to church on Sundays and I, you know, I thought the people were very nice, but outside of Sundays, there was nothing going on for me. Like all of, I, I didn't want to go to the clubs anymore because I was like, if I go there, there's a really good chance that I'm going to get caught up again. I'm going to want to do drugs. I'm going to want to get high. I'm going to want to take home a girl, whatever. So I was like, you know, so I was basically just went to a lot of movies for about six years and I was waiting for God to give me a wife. And I thought that would solve all these problems of loneliness. Meanwhile, meanwhile, I'm trying to get my friends to come to church with me the whole time. Cause I'm an evangelist by heart. So, you know, I was the leader of the pack. I was the promoter. I was like the one that told everybody, okay, we're going to go to this club on this night. And people, people kind of followed me. So when I became a Christian, I, I had this Moses complex where I thought, Oh, you want me to lead everybody to you guys? Sure. I got it. Watch this. Hey everybody, we're going to start going to church now. I try to take all my friends to church. Literally no one followed. So for six years, of course, I didn't give up. I kept trying to get them to come with me and change their ways. And, and I also thought, you know, well, if some of them become Christians, then I'll have someone to hang out with. I thought, right. And, but it didn't work. They just didn't want to, they didn't, for the most part, they didn't really come. If they did come, it was just more, more or less to appease me. Mm -hmm. But, um, so, you know, after six years of, of just kind of isolating, I ended up, I ended up backsliding uh, inadvertently. I, I just, I couldn't do life alone anymore by myself. So I just started going out a little bit more on the weekends. I bought a motor, a friend of mine was going through a divorce. He had a motorcycle. So I bought a bike and we started hanging out and, you know, one thing leads to another. I'm drinking too much and I'm sleeping around again. And yeah. I, was, I was even doing drugs, made a mess, rededicated a few years later. Um, when I rededicated, I went through the exact same period where I, you know, was watching Redbox movies every night by myself. And finally, I was like, you know, this is, this is crazy. Like, where is this abundant life that Jesus talks about? Because my life is surely not abundant. My life sucks. I was like, I was happier before I was a Christian. And that's when I really started, uh, what, you know, the organization that became City Fam. It wasn't an organization back then. It was just I started putting on social and service events mm -hmm. to give myself something to do, and it turned into my nonprofit. But, um, you know, I say all that to say that from living at those those polar ends of the spectrum with sex, um, it really I started to figure out something that I had no understanding of. Because when I started, when God first called me, I did not get the concept of waiting. To me, I was like, why would we wait? I'm like, you know, to me. We're going to make, it's two consenting adults making each other feel good. Like what's, why wait? And I did it because in the beginning for selfish reasons, I thought if I didn't sin long enough, God would give me a wife. So I was, that was the only reason I did it. But then I really started understanding it. And then I, and then I got it so good. I made a video called 10 reasons not to have sex before marriage posted on YouTube. It went viral, became the number one video in the world on the subject for a while. I think it's got like a million and a half views right now. And then I started getting people reach out to me about city fam, which is uh, not, not the abstinent group just to put that out there, but it is a group of people that it's about community and I can make a strong <laughs> argument for sex without commitment breaks community. Nothing mm -hmm. breaks relationships like sex without commitment. So yeah, that's how yeah. I yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. I want to, um, I want to pick, you know, pick that apart a little bit. I want to go kind of, you know, back to, that moment in, in Cancun in those early days of your Christianity. And, and, you know, the question here is you knew that changes needed to be made. You knew, you know, you said everything in your life had to, had to change. Uh, I went through a very similar thing. I, you know, I've shared my story, everybody listening to this. If you haven't listened to episode one, go back and, and hear why really Rob and I are talking today. Cause it's deeply rooted kind of really in my transformation and, and in my journey. But for me, it, I thought that there was going to be that moment, like almost instantaneously, like I surrender, I give my life to Christ, we pray, and then I'm supposed to wake up the next day and everything is supposed to be, it's just supposed to be this new world that I'm living in. Like, I don't have to make any changes because he, the forgiveness is, is for me. For you, I want to know where did the, the, the level of uh, awareness that you really needed to make the changes? Because in order for me to get there, I had to have real strong men speaking into me, leading me, guiding me. Whereas you sound like you kind of did this on your own at the beginning because you were trying to bring your non-Christian friends into the Christian world as, a, as opposed to maybe finding the Christian men to lead you down the path. Yeah. So how did you know at the beginning that like all these immediate changes needed to... Needed well, to 
I mean, I, I, I liken it to the fact that like, if you were, you know, let's say you took the same like road to work, you know, and you went a hundred miles an hour down that road because you're like, there ain't no cops on this road. And then one day you realize, oh yeah, they've been watching the whole time. Like I, I, you know, when you become aware of God, you know, it's, it's like the lights go on and you're like, Oh shit. Mm -hmm. You know, like I knew, I knew then uh, what I was doing was wrong. And I, you know, I knew that the changes were pretty made, obvious that I needed to make. Of course, there's sanctification. Like in the beginning, there's, you think it's just the big things. You're like, okay, well, if I just, you know, stop having sex and I stop doing drugs and I'm good. Mm -hmm. And then you start working, you start seeing other things. But for me, it was, there was just a lot of big things at first that were very obvious that had to stop and had to get out of my life. I mean, stripping, I knew that God didn't want me taking my clothes off for a living yeah. or, you know, promoting, promoting nightclubs where people were, you know, getting, you know, tore up from the floor up and like, I knew that that wasn't something. God, yeah. what do you, what do you say to, to the, to the younger guy? Because, you know, I, I'll, I'll be completely honest. Like, you know, the younger version of me hearing your lifestyle that, that you lived, uh, promoting, stripping all this money, kind of getting paid to party, getting paid well to party as a younger man, I, I would say, man, that's, that's, that's the ideal. That's the life. I mean, so if you had the opportunity to go back and maybe speak to younger Rob, or how do you, how do you speak to younger men now that you know that they're, they don't come to you as Christians. So, so if you're speaking to a secular audience and uh, it's full of young men and, and you're sharing the story and they're hearing all this amazing things, like what is your messaging to the young guy about the real trap and, and how yeah. you can really fall into some real, real darkness kind of living in that world? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at somebody like Charlie Sheen, you know, if they're, depending on how young they are, they might not remember this, <laughs> but, but you know, 15 or 20 years ago, Charlie Sheen was the envy of all men. Mm right? Men wanted to be him. And because he was having a lot of sex and he was very open about the prostitutes and all the partying and he was making a ton of money. And now you look at him and he's just, nobody wants to be Charlie Sheen right now. You know, like, is, you think he's happy? I would say probably not. He's probably, he's a shell of himself. Mm -hmm. And that's the lie. That's what he, that's where this road ends. If you look at somebody like Tim Tebow, on the other hand, that's a real man. That is a man that, you know, good looking guy, athletic, rich, famous. And he said, no, he didn't buy into the bullshit that the world fed him, you know, the lie. And, he, and 20 years from now, 50 years, he'll be very happy. You know, he'll be having tons of sex with his hot wife and he'll be respected, you know, in the world. And he'll have kids that come to visit him and maybe grandkids and like Charlie Sheen ain't getting none of that, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's the lie. That's how it really plays out. And you just got to be smart. All right, that's that's incredible. Let's let's get deep into the reasons behind it. You know, like like people, you know, people listening to this now, they're like, what are these these what are these guys talking about? Like we're we're sexual beings, like this is supposed to happen. What, you know, Christian, non-Christian, like like let's let's get into kind of, you know, whether it's that the the 10 tips with your video or yeah. you want to pick apart the the book and let's let's really talk about why sex before marriage isn't good for anyone. Christian, sure. non-Christian, yeah. uh, speak to, to both right now. And then we'll, we'll get deeper into the Love it. stuff later Again, on. Yes. No one's against sex. I often like to start it out. Like God invented sex. So he doesn't, he wants you to have sex. He wants you to have a lot of sex. He wants you to have great sex. He wants you to be with the right person. That that's, that's, you know, the difference. And I always like to start with just numbers, you know, because yeah. people could disagree with things that you or I say, but you can't deny numbers because mm -hmm. they don't lie. So if you look at people that, that wait to have sex, some people say, oh yeah, if you wait, you're going to rush into it with the wrong person. You're just going to get married for the sex. I'm like, well, the numbers show you that people that marry as virgins only have a 6% divorce rate. 94% of the time they stay married. It's a really high number. People that don't wait to have sex have a 50% divorce rate. 50%. I'm like, I think it's, I think we're numb to it now because, and this is even scarier. I think of the 50% that stay married, what percentage of those people are happy? Cause I don't think it's that high. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people stay together because of the kids or for financial reasons, which tells you that if you don't wait, if you do it like everybody else, which 97% of the population does not wait. If you do it like everybody else, your chances of being happily married are pretty damn slim. 
so that you have to be smarter than everybody else and you have to do it the hard way. And it boils down to something called delayed gratification. Everybody understands delayed gratification in every single area of their life. They understand, hey, if I want to buy a house, I can't spend money whenever I want to. Or if I want to get into great physical shape, I can't just go eat whatever I want. Or I have to go to the gym even if I want to sleep in. Or if I, I might have to study when I want to go party if I want to get an education. Look, Delayed gratification is a universal principle that applies to everything and it includes relationships. So if you get in, the, if you start having sex quickly, I always did this. I was the king of the one night stand. I'd have sex quickly and I would drift into it. Not always, but some, some, one of two things would happen every single time. I'd lose interest immediately after ejaculating, which would happen a lot. Or sometimes I would continue sleeping with the girls and I would drift into a relationship, but it would never it would always feel like something was missing. And then I was looking over my shoulder at other girls wondering if I could be happier with them. And then, you know, but, but at the same time, not somehow not able to let go of her either. Like I'm looking at other girls wondering if I could be happier with them, but then I don't want nobody else sleeping with mm. my girl. So I'm stuck in something. And then sometimes, or actually not sometimes for me, every time that then the physical attraction would go away. So then I'm not even having sex with this girl. I'm just wanting to go to sleep every night wanting to have sex with other girls, but I can't because I'm in a relationship with this one. And now I'm, I'm, it's called the sex trap where now I'm in something. I can't even get out of it. I'm not having, barely having sex with the girl I'm with wondering if I'm going to be happier with somebody else, but can't get out of this. And then I'm thinking, well, well, I guess this is just what relationships are. You know, I guess this was, I mean, they, I, th when I they think say relationships are hard or maybe human beings aren't supposed to be monogamous. Maybe we should try polyamory. Maybe we need to bring in another girl into the relationship. You start going through all these things because here's the deal. You got to wait. You just didn't do it right. That's it. That's all it is. We start thinking all these crazy things and we're trying to fix the problem. The problem is you just got to be obedient and do it God's way, which happens to be the really hard way. Just like if you did bodybuilding, mm -hmm. you know, what's it like to get in that kind of shape? I did a couple shows. You got to get up at the butt crack of dawn. You got to go do cardio on empty stomach. You got to eat like egg whites and just like broccoli and chicken and maybe some brown. Like you could get mad at me all day long. If you said, look, I want to be 4% body fat. And I could say, this is what you need to do. You could be mad and be like, no, that's bullshit. I'm like, I'm sorry. That's the answer. You ain't got to like it. It just happens to be the really hard way. You can't get in that kind of shape without doing those things. And if you want, the best chance of having a successful long-term relationship where you, you know, you find your soulmate. It's just, this is the way to go about it. This is the best strategy. There's no guarantees. I'm not saying there's a guarantee, but this is the best strategy for finding true love and long-term happiness. Yeah. That's incredible per per perspective um, in how, uh, in how you frame that. And, and I mean, those numbers are, like you said, the data, the numbers do not lie. I mean, Shocking six. I mean, I, I knew the 50% uh, divorce rate is, I mean, it's kind of, that's, that's what you hear all the time, but the 6% of people that, that wait, I mean, um, in, yeah, let's in, talk about that because if you think of, like oxytocin, so there's this, and this is what people, I don't know. I don't know about this stuff. I, I don't know when I, when I learned about oxytocin, but it is a real hormone mm. that exists and it makes people stick. They call it the, they call it the love hormone. It makes people bond together. Okay. And you know, the more times you have sex with somebody, the more of this bonding hormone happens and then you start to get attached. The first time that monogamy is mentioned in the Bible is Genesis. It just talks about the, a man will leave his father and mother and will cleave to his, or the, they will cleave together and the two will become one flesh. Yep. Cleaving, it's, if, when you look at cleaving, if, when you look up the definition, it's like glue. It sounds a lot like oxytocin. Mm. And, if, and there's a great TED talk called How Your Brain Falls in Love by a, a biologist named Dawn Mazur. I think she's down in Florida too. And she talks about how oxytocin doesn't get released at the same time. Women release oxytocin during sex. Men release it when they commit. So when you think about that, this is why men can hit it and quit it. You have sex with a girl she releases oxytocin. She gets stuck on you, but you're not stuck on her. You release something called vasopressin. She talks about in the video, but you're not, you're not stuck on her. She's stuck on you. Now she's chasing you around for what? The commitment, because that's the thing that you're in control over. This is why guys propose to women. Mm. This is why women get dictate when we have sex. Most of the time, 99% of the time, they're the ones telling us, okay, we can have sex tonight now for the, when, when it happens to be the first time. So this is why I tell women when you're when you have sex with a man before commitment, which is 
real commitment is marriage. You are putting yourself in a position of disadvantage because now he's not going to be as motivated to marry you. Why would he? Why, why buy the cow when you get the milk for free? Everybody knows the saying. If a guy is getting sex, you're like, why should I commit? You know, why should, why should I marry you and give you the security when, you know, what happens if somebody better comes along? I don't know. You know, like there's real, no, there's no rush and what men will do. And we don't do it consciously. I don't believe is we'll just drag our feet, you know, and we'll, we'll string a girl along for years. And what happens to them is they're getting older. Their mm -hmm. biological clock is ticking. You know what's happening for them. We're making it harder for them to find somebody else down the road. That's what happens because women, you know, like it or like it or not, their bodies are built to have babies. Mm -hmm. So at some point when that biological clock runs out, it becomes a little bit harder. Their dating pool shrinks a little faster than ours. You know, so I, I remember I was dating this girl, I don't know, two years, I think we, maybe three years. It was somewhere between two and three years. And she just, she just, would have she would have put up with anything I did and she was she was a beautiful girl and you know she she gave me all the benefits of a wife and I had none of the responsibilities like I, I mean literally I could have you know when she was out of town I could have sex with other girls so I wanted to and I remember a girlfriend of mine said if you're not going to man up and marry her let her go while she's still young and good good looking enough to find somebody else and it was like a knife through my heart dude and it it was hundred percent true. So I broke up with her and it, and it was still hard. Cause even though I didn't want her, there's that soul tie. She starts drifting off. I want to pull her back and she ended up getting married and she's now she's got two babies and she's on leadership at her church and it, she's doing so good. It was like one of the best decisions I've ever made, but this is, this is the things that we get, get ourselves into when we're not committed to waiting and doing it God's way, you know? Yeah. Wow. Um, Guys, go back and, and, and rewind that and, 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 and listen to that again. And, and I'm going to link, I'm going to link that video. Um, I'm, I'm excited to, to kind of dive into to that, but I'll link that video down there if you guys want to want to check that out. But um, I love the science stuff. I mean, as a, as a health and fitness guy, and I mean, a lot of my audience is coming in and, and they're digging that stuff too. So I've never heard, you know, I've never heard it kind of framed in, framed in that context. Um, just, just in, in, incredible. Um, I want to kind of throw some, some objections at you now. And I know that, that this is one that you probably get quite a bit. Um, what if you get married and the sex isn't good? Yeah. So, <laughs> so how do you, so how do you, you know, Absolutely. That's the number one. yeah, I thought a lot about that one. I've talked a lot about it. So th this is the way I, I look at it is so, okay. Let's say the sex is good, right? Let's say you're not committed to waiting. The sex is good and you get married to the person. And then she gets hit by a car or she gets cancer and now she can't have sex as much or at all. Mm. What do you do? Do you leave? Because what I say is if, if the sex, if the relationship is built on, does she tickle me right? Then you might leave. And that would make you a real shit bag and your vows really don't mean anything. Mm. So don't get married. But love isn't about that. Love is about sacrifice. And I've never been in love, but what I, what I know is love is you cannot, get rid of the link between love and sacrifice a mother. How much does a mother love a child? Unconditional. Exactly. Unconditionally. So there is no conditions. And what would the mother do for the child? Anything. It doesn't matter if it'd be like, it'd be like a mother taking a baby home from the hospital and going, well, what happens if he doesn't walk at three months? Can I bring him back? Like, no, it would, she would never say that. She's just in love with that little baby. So I imagine that when you make love to the person that you're in love with, it's probably going to be good, you know, and if it's not, you're in love with them and you're going to work through it just like you would work through cancer or them getting hit by a car. Yeah. Well, if the, if the relationship is, is built on love and not built on sex and you both are coming in it with the, with the right frame of mind and the right perspective that whether you did or did not wait, you're now at this point where you're going to, you're going to make this relationship work no matter what, just like everything that we do, sex is a skill. Like you can get better at it. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's different approaches and, and, and we don't want to make the, you know, we don't make this a sex class, but um, I mean, I know that first time I had sex, I wasn't, you know, 
it, it, it wasn't what it was like the second time or the hundredth, you know what I mean? Like, so yeah. it is something that you can get together and there, there's real trust built in that relationship, the communication, you guys can communicate, work that out, take a class together, learn some techniques, try things, experiment. Like that's, I think when it gets really fun, when you're communicating about what you're doing, as opposed to, Oh, that sucks. Like, I don't want to be with you. Right. Absolutely. You'll have lots of time to practice is what I say. Here's the other thing. I mean, when you're, I've been waiting for a while. You, now you've been waiting. Mm-hmm. So w- what I'm going to tell people is, look, any sex is better than no sex. <laughs> like if she ain't that good, we'll work on it. But it, I, I mean, here's the thing. Focus on connection. Don't focus on, you're only having sex. This is the number 0.45% of the time, 99.55% of the time you are not having sex in life. So I hope you like the person. Yeah. You know, cause it's a lot of time that you're not going to be having sex. So what I would say is if the connection's good, then the sex is probably going to be good. I know I've, I've, I've dated girls where before we had sex, I could feel this intense chemistry, like this intense sexual tension and the sex usually matched up. It was good. So if I'm feeling that with somebody else and the connection's good and I'm willing to go all in on the person, which is, again, I, I, t- I challenge people to say, look, I've done this. I've lived on this side. And I've lived on this side. I have a very unique perspective. So it's not like I'm, it's not a hypothesis or something I'm theorizing. I've done it. I'm telling you, like, I have beautiful girls around me a lot now, like within the organization. And some of them aren't committed to waiting. Some of them would have sex with me if I wanted to. And I get lonely and I get horny sometimes. And in my mind, my carnal mind, I've gone through this process where I'm like, you know, I, you know, such and such, she's, she's a good girl. She's a, she's a Christian. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe I could fall in love with her. Maybe she'd just call her up tonight, ask her if she wants to hang out. Like, cause I would be lonely or mm-hmm. I'd be depressed because of it's been a long time. And this is what I would do in my mind. I'd go, would you sign the marriage contract to have sex with her? And I go, no. This is prior to even no, hanging out is, with her. This is prior to hanging out with her because okay. I'm like, look, I can tell, I mean, if I know there's no chance, I'm not saying that I don't need to date, but if I know that like, really like there's no chance of me marrying this girl, then I'm not going to put myself in a position where I could screw up and fail because what could happen is if I end up sleeping with her, one, it'll break the relationship, our friendship, or two, we'll drift into, we'll drift into something. And then I'll end up right back to where I always was, where it feels like something's missing, you know, but I imagine there will be a girl one day that comes along that I'll look at and I'll, I'll ask myself, would you sign the marriage contract or, or basically look at it this way? Could I be happier with somebody else mm. before having sex with her? If you can't answer no, then don't do it. Don't, you know, don't, don't wife her. The problem is I would ask myself that question after I was in the relationship. Can I be happier with somebody else? But now I'm already in something complicated. So how are you, so how are you managing, I mean, a dating life if it exists at all. I mean, uh, for what it sounds like is you have put extreme kind of boundaries, uh, around you. I mean, you know, somebody's, you know, can't stop drinking. Don't go into the bar like, duh. Um, you know, you, and this is, you know, going through, you know, the coaching that we do here, uh, with my company, like we're getting guys off of porn. Step one. Well, after, you know, admitting that you really have an issue. The next step is eliminating the, you know, porn from the site. You know, we have different sites that we use if the guy's really at, at that severe, but it's like, it's like a purge. It's like, we got to get this all out. So we don't even have access to it. But here it, it sounds like you're, you're almost the, the dating life is, is non-existent or, or if it is, how do you kind of, how do you manage that and navigate it? And what does the conversation look like um, with the, with the female? Does she have to be Obviously, if she's going to date you, then yeah, she's committed to, to the same lifestyle. Do you right. look at her past or because of yours, it's like, yeah, that's okay. Like I'm not, I'm not judgmental. And- right. A um, couple things. So what, one, my boundaries were, you know, for basically when I rededicated back, this was back in 2012 is when I stopped having sex again. I got, you know, pure again sexually. And um, I went up three years abstinent. And it was just a lot of willpower, to be honest, a lot of determination. And then I made a mistake with a girlfriend one night that I was telling you about a girl just watching a movie one night at my house. Mm-hmm. We ended up having sex. After that, I didn't spend time alone with women for like years, you know, f- 
four over four years, I probably didn't spend ever get alone with them because I just didn't trust myself. Mm -hmm. It was always my kryptonite, you know, like, and I think this is people have to know themselves. I'm not saying that everybody has to have that boundary. But if you like you said, if you were an alcoholic, and you go, I can't go into a bar, that's just Hey, look, that's your trigger. So for me, it's like, I don't want to be alone with a female because I just didn't trust myself for a while. And I, I, I knew God had a plan for my life and I didn't want to screw it up. And I was willing to make that sacrifice. And it was super, super difficult. Um, but now, like, so I, I guess I went through about a seven or eight year period where I didn't date at all because it, God just hadn't told me to do anything. He hadn't said it was time. Like, I'm a, I'm a big believer in not only who, like God, like letting God choose the who, but also when, mm -hmm. and he, and so I was, I was up to my eyeballs with city fam. I didn't have any time or any money. And to me, a woman would have just been a distraction at that point. And I was praying all about it. There were definitely lots of loneliness, lonely times in there, but he wasn't saying anything about moving. So I, and nobody was coming into my peripheral that I was in, interested in. So I wasn't searching it out, you know? Um, <clears throat> and I, I look at, um, you know, when I look at like Adam and Eve, for, you know, or let's just say Adam, you know, this is what I tell people. This is the way I, God's honest, think that it works. Adam didn't, Eve didn't come along until Adam had a job. God gave Adam the job to name all the animals. He named all the animals before Eve came along. I heard a speaker talk about, it could have been, it could have been hundreds of years before Eve came along. We don't know. Yeah. But you know what the first words Adam said when he saw Eve? Finally, exclamation point. Finally. So we know it was a while. Mm. So there, there's delayed gratification again. Most people don't want to go through it. It's hard. It's difficult. But I believe that this is the way it works. There's something in Think and Grow Rich that talks about sex transmutation. Chapter 12. It's great, right? So it's this principle. Sexual energy can be harnessed. And it's like damming a river. If you hold it back, eventually it's going to find an outlet. And it, it, for me, it found an outlet where I've started a nonprofit. I wrote a book. I wrote another book. I'm working, I'm work, working on a third book. I just did a world tour. Like I found things to do with that energy that I was using, using to chase tail as I had to do something with it, work 15 hour days a lot of times. And now I have, the, you know, I have this cake that I baked that God's given me all these amazing things to work on. And now the wife's going to come along, I believe, hopefully soon. And she's going to be the icing. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I spoke at a church not long ago and I told him, I said, if God would have gave me the wife nine years ago, you know what we would have worked on? Nothing. Because I didn't have anything going on. Most people don't want to bake the cake. They just want the icing first. It don't work like that. You got you to damn that river. You got to fit. God's going to, you hold that sexual energy back. You let God tell you what your purpose is. And now you let him bring that person into your life and you can see her with a clear set of eyes when you're not having sex and you choose that right person to now come alongside you to help you reach your potential with whatever it is he told you to do. That's how it works. That's the order that we have to get it in. So I believe that God was helping me get all these things started, allowed me to use my sexual energy. And now I'm getting to a place where my finances are improving, structure of city fam's good. You know, like hope, I'm hoping that in the next year before I'm a senior citizen, <laughs> that he brings a wife into the picture and we're able to, you know, travel the world and do some cool stuff together. But yeah, that's what I believe. You asked something else at the end and I forget what it was. <clears throat> you remember what it was? Oh God. It was, I mean, um, you got, you got me with that. Most people don't want to bake the cake. They just want the icing thing. <laughs> like scrambling to, to, to write that down. Um, you asked something and I wanted to say something. I forget. It, it'll, it'll, it'll come, but um, I'm so glad you went to, to the Napoleon Hill to, to the sexual transportation. We've, we've discussed that on a, on a handful of episodes and they're truly, I mean, there's, there's, there's a deep underlying meaning behind the title of this, of this podcast. I mean, the superhuman life, because I, I had, I had success in, in my previous life, so to speak. I mean, you talked about the bodybuilding. Um, I, I had success in both corporate America and in, in launching and in building my first business. But um, it wasn't until I was able to fully surrender and commit and then experience what it feels like to take all that energy that I had just been blasting through sex and then ejaculating into a towel because I was addicted to porn. Like I was literally just blasting my energy. So when I was able to come to the awareness and fully harness that, I mean, I... I felt limitless. Like there, there was nothing in the world that I, that I couldn't do. Like I truly unlocked almost superhuman powers. And I mean, I, I wish every guy could experience that feeling of going 
an extended period, you know, semen retention, no fap, you know, long period of absence. I mean, whatever word you want to attach to it, I, I don't care what that is. Uh, but, but pick up the book if you haven't read it. Read chapter 12. If that's the only chapter that you read, it will change your life because what you're saying, how you were able to take all that energy and, and create this life that you're, you're starting to build now. Um, so let's get into to some of that because we've talked about city fam a little bit. I want to I want to make sure that we that we give that its due attention because I think what you're doing there is is truly incredible. So so what is city fam and 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 how are you guys really changing you know changing the landscape of I guess social activities would maybe be yeah uh, yeah I mean for the most part uh, what do we call I'm trying to think of a term that we use the social. Uh, I forget what it was. It was a ter- it's a term we haven't used in a while. You said social made me, made me think of it. But anyway, it was so city fam was kind of birthed out of the idea of when I became a Christian and I didn't relate to religious people. And then all of a sudden, you know, like I'm like wondering, OK, how do I do this? You know, what do I do on the weekends now? And I isolated for a long time. And then eventually I backslid, went back to the bars and then I rededicate it. And then I did the same thing. I isolated for a while. And then I was like. I was complaining to somebody and they said to me, well, you were a promoter. Why don't you start organizing events that give you something to do that won't cause you to make mistakes? Light bulb went off. So I started organizing social events that we called what we call now fun without regrets. And basically, you know, they were edgier than probably they weren't a faith, a Christian event. I didn't want to, I didn't want to do any faith based or Christian events because I went, I really wanted to get my friends from my past to come. So they were a little edgier, but I had friends in church that loved Jesus that were normal, I often have to say, but they were bored also. They were sitting around every weekend with their thumb up their ass going, you know, they were doing, they were suffering like I was. So I'm like, look, I'm going to put this event together. We're going to go whatever, see this band or go sporting event or whatever it was. And, And then they would come and then I would get my old friends that I had been inviting to church that weren't coming. They would come to the social event. They would meet my friends from church. And then all of a sudden they would build relationships and then they would end up in church and then some of them would get saved. And I was like, huh, that's pretty cool. You know? So then I, so then I started organizing, I I noticed this thing happen. At the time I was, I was volunteering through my church and it was, I was liking myself again because I liked the way it it made me feel like a good person to volunteer. And I was like, man, I I know my friends, my, my old friends, they need to feel this because, you know, I'm sure they don't, I know how they feel. I know what you, when you're partying like that, it's fun in the moment, but you look at yourself in the mirror and you, you don't like yourself a lot. So I was like, they need to feel this, but they're not going to come to the church coat drive. So let me organize some service events and not, again, not call them any kind of faith based anything. And then I invited my friends from church. They came and they served. And then I invited my old friends and they came and they served more relationships were built. More people got saved. I was like, man, this is awesome. You know, so after a while, the, the group grew to a certain point where it was big enough that we had to give it a name. We called it City Fam. And now, and this is all God looking back. I, I made the video, the 10 Reasons video. I wrote the book initially. I had a great understanding of sex, but I didn't, you know, I didn't really have any aspiration necessarily to write a book. I wanted to talk about City Fam because I saw not only what it was doing for me, it was giving me something to do on the weekends so I didn't backslide it was get, it was reaching a lot of people. A lot of people were meeting the Lord through it. And I was like, man, I want to, I want to tell more people about this thing. Cause I feel like everybody, every city needs one, but I couldn't get the word out about it because here I was just a guy that started a nonprofit. But I was like, if I write a book, then that will open doors. Mm. So I wrote, I was writing the book. And when I wrote the book, I made the 10 reasons video right around the time I was finishing the book. I posted it. It went viral. It was definitely God because people were, they hit me up. They're like, I don't even know why this is on my suggested videos. I never watch videos like this. So it was, it was definitely God. And at the very end of the video, the 10th reason or the number one reason, the last one says better to have long-term friends than short-term sex partners. And I say, me and some friends started a group called city fam. So now I got all these people going, Hey, um, what you said makes sense. We're, we're waiting to, how do we start one of these groups? So now people start reaching out and now we're like, okay, let's figure out how to scale it, how to show other people how they can start one of these things. So now we got, we have about 15 cities in various, like mostly in the beginning stages of starting up. But I think honestly, it's the best lead funnel to the church I've ever seen. You know, like I, the church has got, gotten into this point where we're inviting people to come to the building. And that's not what Jesus said to do. Jesus said, go. 
right? So we're supposed to go to them. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is it's dangerous. You know, he says, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. So if you go to the bar by yourself, very good chance you could get eaten by a wolf, <laughs> right? Because you're a sheep. So, but if you go together, if there's a, then there, then there's some strength in numbers and you start to change the temperature. You act as a thermostat where now all of a sudden they're start being attracted to you because they're like, well, these guys, they look like they're having fun. They're, you know, that's a lifestyle I can relate to. And next thing you know, you know, you start changing the, the climate and that's what's happened for us a lot. Um, but it, yeah, it, for me, it's been, it's been great because it's enabled me to, to walk this narrow path. Cause again, I've been, been on this thing for like, just it, since I rededicated nine years and without a group like city fam, there's just no way I could have made it because I, you can't do it alone, man. Like you will, you will date out of loneliness and get into a relationship mm -hmm. with the wrong person, or you'll go back to a bad habit. A lot of people drink cause you know, or they use drugs cause they don't have community. Great, yeah. great Ted talk called, um, the opposite of addiction is connection. Did you ever hear about Rat Park? No, I'm not, no, not familiar with it. A really good. I, I would just touch on it briefly. A guy named Johan Hari. He's written a couple of books about it, but he talks about the key, the root causes of addiction is because we're meant for we are meant for connection with each other, and when we don't have connection with each other, we'll connect with that. We'll connect with something else. That thing could be gambling, pornography, sex, whatever. And he talks about. In the 70s, they did this study with these rats where they put them in cages by themselves. And they introduced into each cage, they introduced this water that was laced with heroin. Mm -hmm. And nine out of the 10 rats drank the heroin water till they overdosed and died. Then they took the, these other laboratory rats, they put them in a cage with other, these other rats. They were all in there together. Not interested put, in the heroin. 100%. They put a little maze in there. They let, them they let them establish some social dynamics. Then they introduced the drug water and th only three out of 10 tried it. None of them drank till they overdosed. And I was like, well, no shit. They had something to do. <laughs> That's what it's like. If you don't have community, you will drink the heroin water or you'll, you'll screw yourself to death or you'll do something. So that's what city fam is. It's like, look, let's help each other become the best version of ourselves, but let's also have a good time in the process. You know, cause I don't want to be, I don't want to just see you on Sunday, bro. And then not see you again. On, let's do life together. Let's go to the bar together. Maybe let's go see a band. Let's go to a ball game. I don't know. Let's, let's invite our friends that are, you know, jacked up getting out of a bad relationship or, or, you know, they drink too much because they don't have this. Let's bring them in and watch them get better. That's, that's what city fam is. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's so powerful what, what you said there and, and, and as believers and Christians where we're called to disciple, we're called to, to spread the gospel. And if we're only hanging out with other Christians, if we're only spending time with other believers, we're living in a bubble. We're living in a shell where we're not fully living out what we're called to do because we're called to bring people to the cross. We're called to bring people to Christ. And that's only going to happen outside of the church walls. Uh, so I love, I love what you guys are, are doing there. And in the connection piece, um, you know, just, just speaking real quickly to, to the guys that we're, you know, we're, we're talking to in terms of, of the mission of the podcast, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with this addiction, whether it's alcohol or pornography for, for a lot of you guys out there, that connection piece is so huge. You're, you're, you're dealing with the guilt, you're dealing with the shame, the social anxiety, and you're trapping yourselves in the, in the four walls. Um, and, and I was reading, uh, I can't remember the article or book that it was last week, but if we don't have seven personal one-to-one -one connections on a daily basis, uh, the chances of falling into clinical depression, mm -hmm. it's like 80% higher. Like if you're not getting just those Seven, seven connections on a daily basis. I mean, I can tell you that there were times in, in my life when I was deep in, in my addiction that I would go days without a single human connection wow. uh, because, because just the fear of the truth really, really coming out. And I know you're, you know, you, you didn't deal with it. Dude, that's in, awesome, in man. I love it. I mean, yeah, no, I've struggled, I've struggled with it, you know, especially when I was coming out of that lifestyle. I, I, I abstain, but I, I would have this OCD uh, like behavior where I'd go, I might go a week without looking at any, like porn and then it, the thought would come back and then I would say, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. And then it would come back and I'd dismiss it again. And then it would come back and then it would come back. And, then, and to the point where I just had to look at it because of that, it, it, it wouldn't, it was like plaguing my mind. And then I got, you know, 
I might go a month now, but like, it's still, this hasn't been easy. I'm not trying to say I'm perfect, you know, like I haven't mastered it. Um, but at the same time, like, I, I don't know why the verse that I was thinking of and I, sh I share somewhat regularly is there's a verse in the New Testament that says, let no, let no one be sexually immoral or godless like Esau who traded his birthright for a bowl of stew. Uh, have you ever read that verse? I haven't, no. So you think about it. Like the, I don't know if you know the story about Jacob and Esau. Mm -hmm. Okay, J Esau was the older brother, and he comes in, he trades his birthright for a bowl of stew. I remember the first time I read that, I was like, what does that have to do with sex? You know, because it says, let no one be sexually immoral or godless like Esau traded his birthright for a bowl of stew. When you think about it, Esau traded something permanent for something very temporary, right? Birthright would have been his whole life. Bowl of stew lasted him a couple hours. That's what it's like when you have, when you bust a nut, you know what I mean? Or you have mm -hmm. casual sex, you're trading your birthright. And that I believe is your purpose and your soulmate for a bowl of stew, a piece of ass. And then three hours later, you're horny again. You know, that's what it's like. So you, yeah, it, you have to learn to master it. You have to learn to master this thing. If you're going to reach your full potential, and figure out what you're put on this earth to do and the person to come alongside you to help you with it. It's, it's, it's a thing you're going to have to figure out. So outside of just, you know, just, just white knuckling it and just, you know, just relying on, you know, discipline and, and staying away and, you know, avoiding the boundaries, like, are there, you know, are there tips? You know, I, I know there's no hacks. I know there's no like, you know, perfect formula, but, but a guy comes to you and he's like, Rob, man, I like, I'm all in, man. Like, like you, you, you've got me, man. Like I'm, I'm bought into the mission, but I don't have your discipline. I'm not willing to not date. I need to have a female, you know, to, I got to spend time like that. I, I, I'm not willing to give that up. I can give up sex, but I need some help. So do you, is there, is there advice tips that you give guys on, on yeah. how to manage it? I don't, I'm not saying don't spend time with girls. If you can do it, that's the thing. That's the if, because you have to, it's risk reward, you know, mm -hmm. for me, like, so the tip, the tip, there's two tips. One is confess your sins that right. The word says, confess your sins one to another that you might be healed. So you have to get some guys in your life that you can be really honest with and say, look, man, I'm struggling or I did this or whatever it is. Because if you're not honest, if you keep it quiet, you're never going to get over it. That's a spiritual principle. Mm -hmm. So you have to have some guys in your life that you can be re really honest. The second thing is, and this is a big one that's helped me, is there's an article and I'll, I'll share it with you and then you can maybe you know put it wherever, but it's, it's about why you should sign a covenant with God. And it talks about Job in the book of Job. He said, he, he signed, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a maiden. That was something that Job said. So what this article suggests you do, and I've done it several times is you sign a covenant. So basically first, very first thing is, you know, God, as I started to get obedient in this area, God started to reveal my purpose to me. And it was so good and so exciting, but it was also very big. And it was like, there's no way that's going to happen without his help. I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough money, whatever it is. So the, the way the, the, the covenant article goes is, look, you, you sign this covenant. You say, look, God, I'm going to sign a covenant with you. I'm not going to look at a girl with lust. I'm not going to hold a, a thought intentionally in my mind. I'm not going to look at porn. I'm not going to have sex, whatever. And you know, this is hard for me. So I'm asking you to help me keep this covenant. You can, you set the date for, you might want to start with one day in the beginning. Maybe you're, if you're strong, you go a month, maybe you go six months, whatever. But you say, look, God, I'm going to sign this covenant and I want you to help me keep it. And if I keep it, I want you to open doors for me, God, that no man can shut. And I want you to bless me greatly. But if I don't keep it, I want you to punish me severely. And I want mm -hmm. you to fight against me with the sword of your mouth, Jesus. That's what the, the article says. And what, it, and then you sign it and you date it. And what it does, and I've done it, is it gives you the gas because you want the blessing but it gives you the break because you fear the punishment. And there were a lot of nights I went to bed depressed. So I wish I could tell you like, you know, like people say tap, you know, just pray and tap into the Holy spirit. I didn't, for me, I just, it was a lot of white knuckling and it was a lot of grit and it was just like talking to guys and then I fail, I, you know, then I sign a covenant and then, you know, I just, I trip my way to the finish line. And if you have to do that, then that's just what you have to do. But that, that, but that was, those are, those are my the only two tips and I keep really good boundaries. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, just, just from, from an outsider's perspective and, you know, just here chatting with you for, you know, the last hour plus and, you know, the little bit of uh, kind of, you know, background that I, that I know on you. 
I feel in, in your case and, you know, would love your opinion in, in terms of other guys that are trying to, you know, maybe move forward this, like you've are now in a place where your life is built for something beyond you. You know, there's a service built into everything that you're doing, a service to others. And, and in that case, I feel that that has been probably something that you've been able to, you know, lean in or has been able to pull you along in those times of like real struggle, real challenge. Cause I, I don't know exactly what you've gone through, but, but, but I mean, I've, I've felt it cause I've, I've experienced a very case okay, similar kind of, you know, change in, change in my life. As we were talking, I mean, you're on, you know, the far ends and I'm like, you know, here in like the, the red yellow of the spectrum light, you know, you're like dark, dark red maroon. And I'm like where it turns from orange to red, you know, on, on both sides there. Uh, and I'll, and I'll get to, to the end there with you, but, but having something outside of you beyond you, that's in a service base. Um, do you feel that that, I mean, like that that's where a guy needs to, you know, possibly put, you know, put a lot of his, his energy and in, in, in yeah. focus. I think, well, definitely volunteering. I mean, volunteering, you get all kind of feel good chemicals when you help other people. So I definitely like, that's part of my, my program for staying on the right path, working out, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one, sometimes you got to say it, you know, like for me, like I was very out when I, especially when I started to understand the concept, I started talking about it. Like, Hey, this is the right way to go. You know, and then it kept me accountable because I didn't want to look like a hypocrite. So I would suggest, you know, be, be vocal about it. When I first, you know, quit drinking back in 2012, I posted it on Facebook because mm -hmm. it gave me accountability. And then when I, I actually drank five weeks after I did it and I posted that and I got, when I posted, when I got back on the wagon, because I, you know, even when I made, when I made, when I had sex twice in the last nine years, I posted it because I want the accountability because I, I, I need to know that if I fuck up, excuse my language, that I'm going to tell myself and I, this way I, I don't, I won't mess up or I, or it's less likely. Well, cause I don't want to keep anything quiet. I don't want anyone to go, aha, we caught you. Like, you like, no, I'll tell them myself. You don't need to act like you caught me. Um, so yeah, get in, get on leadership at your church, you know, get into a great faith community and then get into a small group and get around some men that you can be honest with and just don't keep anything a secret because you know, the, like they say in the program, you're only as sick as your secrets. Right. I think that there's a lot of truth to that. You know, like if you keep it quiet, it's going to fester. Yeah. There's, there's, there, there's so much power behind, behind vulnerability. I mean, I, I, I did a video, God, this is probably going back almost a year ago. So now, but the power behind, you know, kind of the, the phrase that I used was, was really opening your heart, like, like really just opening up, uh, the inside and sharing everything that's you've done that you're not proud of that, that, that you are, I mean, just, just becoming completely vulnerable. And that's where you really just get to the sense of just freedom. Like, freedom. I mean, right. You know what they say is when you can talk about it, the devil can't use it against you anymore. <laughs> it's like that scene from eight mile. You remember when Eminem comes out at the end yep. and he just, he just says, yeah, you did this and I live in a trailer park. And he like, he, he what, took all their ammunition away from them right at the beginning. I'm, yeah. But, and the guy's just sitting there like, uh, what, I, can't, I can't even say anything to you anymore because you just took all the bullets out of my gun. Yeah. So, I'm, I mean, I'm sure, you, I'm, I'm sure you get a lot of pushback and you get haters and, and, and stuff online. And I mean, in, in the way in dealing with that is, yeah, like, like I'm, I'm as screwed up as, as the next guy. I'm not here saying that I'm perfect, but I've lived both, like you said, I've lived on both, both sides and I'm just here to share, share the story and, and share the power of it. Yeah. Yeah, you're right though. It is. It's complete freedom. When you, when you can talk about it, it's awesome. The devil wants to make you ashamed because yeah. that keeps you quiet, you know, and that get, that prevents you from getting free. And the thing is, is what the word says is no temptation is, as uh, taking you or I don't remember the word, but basically no, there's no temptation except what is common to man, you know? So everybody goes through the exact same thing. And, but for some reason, the devil's found a way to make us ashamed. Mm -hmm. You you know, and yours is dirtier than everybody else's. No, look, we all deal with the same things. Yeah. So the best thing you can do is just talk about it and, you know, help each other up. Yeah. Guys, I, this, this is one of those episodes like you, you listen to, then you listen to it again, and then you scroll down to the show notes and you click on all these resources because he's dropped TED Talks and, and articles and other videos and we're going to link up all of all of uh, Rob's stuff as, as, as well. Um, 
So you mentioned you're working on a, on a new project, on a new book. Um, we want to make sure that we direct people to, to the current one they have out, the, the Why Waiting Works. Are you able to share anything in terms of this new well, thing? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, sure, I'd love to. It's, it's called Go, actually. Okay. Go with exclamation point. Because that's what, uh, you know, Jesus, when he sent his disciples, he said go. And um, <clears throat> it really is. So my dream, and this is all, again, man, the promised land, dude, when God takes you to your promised land, dude, it's so good and so like worth it. The wilderness sucks. I'm not going to lie. This is the way I, I like in the story of the Israelites when they were in Egypt, you know, they were, they were slaves. They had, you know, three square meals. They had a roof over their head, but God wanted to take them to this better place, a uh, promised land and where they were going to not be making bricks. Some of them were going to be blacksmiths and some of them were going to be farmers. And, you know, they were, they were meant to do something else. They were born, you know, they had these other purposes, but they had to go through this wilderness period to get to the promised land. And it wasn't fun. You know, the wilderness wasn't fun, but they had to learn to trust God and, you know, wait on him. And, and I believe everybody has to go through that exact same thing to leave Egypt. If you're having sex, you know, and you're, you're living in sin or whatever it is, you're in Egypt. You know, you have, it's like having your three square meals. You're having some sex. That's with me. I was making a lot of money as a club promoter. I had a lot of sex but I knew that I was meant for something more and I had to go through that wilderness. And now I'm stepping into this promised land and it's like, Holy shit, man. Wow. This place is amazing. Like, I can't believe this is what I, I and it's so suited to me. So like the, the book go is about um, it's about really challenging the church to do some, what we're calling social evangelism. Look, mm -hmm. the, the, the average church, first off the churches, there's six, six to 10,000 churches close every year in the United States. So we are losing ground. The church overall is losing ground. You got mega churches that grow, but for the most part, most churches are, you know, shrinking or closing. The average church leads less than 10 people to Jesus every year. And if you look at the early church, the very first church in Acts, they were not like us. They were, they did life together. It says they, they met in their houses and they devoted themselves to the fellowship of the believers, the breaking the bread and the prayer. So they were just hanging out with each other, just doing life together. And it's, and it says the Lord added to their number daily, those who were being saved. So literally every day people were getting saved. That's, there's something that we're missing. And I believe it's because most churches don't do life together. They're like, okay, see you next Sunday, bro. Good luck. You know, like, and that, that's not what this is supposed to be. So I want to show people, you know, how we've built city fam treats churches, how they can do it for themselves, which is like, look, um, get in, get into small groups and, and do things besides Bible study together. Like do a, do a social, do something, go gr grill some steaks on Friday night or, you know, and then go out and volunteer in the community and go invite your unchurched friends to those things. Don't invite them to church. You've been inviting them to church. They ain't coming. 82% of the population doesn't go to church on any given Sunday. So invite them instead to something fun or to maybe to volunteer. I, you know what people say when they come to city fam events and they volunteer, they go, man, I've always wanted to do something like this. I just didn't know how to get started. You think about that. Like yeah. there's, there shouldn't, that shouldn't be, there shouldn't be a barrier to entry for people to volunteer, but there is, I mean, most people aren't going to just go, show up to a soup kitchen by themselves, you know, like they need somebody to kind of tell them, okay, come on, we're going, we're going, you can come with us. And so that, that's what I want to, I want the book to challenge people and I want them to teach them this, this methodology that we developed this ladder. It's, it's a four prong ladder and, and teach them how to really, you know, grow their church. Really. Amazing. Amazing. Do we have a, do we have a, a date release date yet? Or is it, is it too early in the, uh, I think it's going to be later this year. Okay. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, when, when, when the advanced readers copy comes out, I'll send you a copy and, and let you read it. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'm waiting on why waiting works, uh, to show up. Oh. I, it should be here this afternoon. Nice. Um, I, I was hoping to get a, I was hoping to get it overnighted uh, on Amazon. Cause I didn't, I didn't, I didn't order it till Monday, but there was no, there was no overnight delivery, even, even as a prime member, but it should be, should be showing up here, uh, hopefully today or, or sometime this weekend. And, um, yeah, I'll, I'll report back, uh, to you guys on, you know, on my feedback on, on the book. We'll, uh, we'll get it, we'll get it on the superhuman life, uh, podcast.com website under our, under our books tab. Um, so, you know, if you guys want to grab it, we'll, we'll link it up and, and we'll share, share all of his stuff down there, um, as well. As we're kind of bringing this to a close, I'm, uh, we have a, we have a question we ask at the, at the, uh, the end of every show, but I want to give you an opportunity because this was an amazing powerful conversation. I know that there's going to be 
tons and tons of people that I want to get more of Rob. So um, if, if, if they want to get into your world, uh, where's the best place? Direct them wherever you want to go. Yeah. Um, you know, where's the best place to learn more about you, about City Fam? If they're interested in maybe opening up a chapter, I want to definitely get uh, on, a, on another call with you at some point here uh, to maybe see if there's something we can do. In, in, in Heck yeah, up. dude. Uh, love it. I love to so, get, you, get you started down in Tampa. Yeah, you, so, got, you got what it takes. Seriously. Yeah. So, so where can people find out more if they're interested in the City Fam or, or just Rob, Rob in general? What's the best place to, to kind of tap into your world? whywaitingworks.net they can get a free copy of the book and and the book okay. does a great job of breaking breaking it down practically why it makes sense to wait i think you have to pay shipping and handling but you get uh, a bunch of bonuses with it for so for less than 10 bucks you get like the study guide and the videos that go with the small group so if you want to do a small group around it's called the truth about sex um you okay. can, it's a it's a it's a uh, eight-week small group and you know what what i like about that is because Again, the book does break down practically. Okay, look, it's almost to the point where you can't even deny it. Okay, you're like, okay, I think he's probably right. Okay, but what the, what the small group curriculum does for you is now it gives you some, some people that, that are also coming to this realization to now do life with. Mm. Okay, week number five in the small group curriculum is you do a social event. So you now, you know, and then you invite your, your unchurched friends to that social event. Week number seven is you do a service event. And you actually take any money that you made from your social event and you go donate it to a local charity and you guys go out and volunteer together. So by the end of the eight weeks, now you got a group of people that are doing life together. And it, very, it simulates what it was like for us when we started City Fam. So my, my hope is that a lot of people will start small groups. They'll stop having sex. They'll stop trading what they want um, most for what they want right now, which I'd say is the definition of failure. That's what you're doing when you're having uh, casual sex mm -hmm. is you're trading what you want most for what you want right now. They'll stop. They'll get into a group where of people there where they're doing life together. They'll start reaching their friends, you know, and pulling them into healthy community. And then, you know, we can we can start a worldwide movement and you know lead a lot of people back to Jesus before he returns because he's coming back. Um, Amen. Probably a lot sooner than than people think. Um, but yeah, cityfam.com. Go join the fam. You get our emails. If if any, you know, if you're like, hey man, I'd love to start a chapter. We can tell you what that looks like. If you just want to connect with me, Rob B. Kowalski. Um, Rob B. So two B's Kowalski, and that's Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Yeah, we'll get we'll get all that stuff linked linked down below. Like I said, free book with all these bonuses. I think I paid I don't know fourteen sixteen ninety nine on on Amazon. I didn't get any of those extra bonuses. I'll send you everything. Maybe I, I was just gonna say maybe I can maybe I can convince you to to send me some of that other stuff. So um, yeah, guys guys, pick up the book. I mean, uh, under ten bucks. If this resonated in any way for you, it, it's time to you got to take the next step. You got to take action. And, and I think this is the best way, the best way to do it. Um, Rob brother, man, I, this was amazing. This, 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 I could, I could sit here and record for, for hours with you. I know that we get into so much more, so we may have to have you back on. I think we'll probably Absolutely. will when, the, when, when the next book comes out, but, um, and for you guys as well, can we, can we talk about here in a couple of weeks? Cause this, uh, this, this episode will be released, uh, will be coming out on July get the calendar uh july 13th uh so so two weeks after that uh you and i will be linking up again so can we can we direct them to where yeah. if they want to hop on that conversation as sure, well where yeah. they can where they can find us it'll be streaming live on uh facebook and youtube on that monday the 27th okay and then what was i going to say oh they could they could hear the they, afterward they can hear it if they want to on my at kowalskianalysis.com okay Awesome. If, they, if they want to, they can watch, they can watch the stream later, you know, live on, on Facebook uh, on the 27th or YouTube or, and it'll also be there afterwards. So they can, anytime after the 27th, if they want to listen to it, they can go to Kowalski analysis. Yeah. Yeah. If you guys are not doing anything on a Monday night at 7 PM, I mean, tune in and, and check out what it's like. You guys listen to these on a weekly basis. You know, you get, you'll get to see what it feels like in, in live real reaction. We tried to get this one streamed. Um, we did, I didn't have enough time to kind of prepare, but um, yeah, guys, definitely, definitely join us there on, on the 27th, 7, uh, 7 PM EST, um, Facebook, YouTube, um, and we'll get all that stuff linked down below. Um, so Rob, man, this is, this is something we, we wrap up every single podcast with, um, you know, there's, like I shared, there's, there's a deep underlying meaning behind the title of, of the podcast. I mean, um, I had a life that's had some achievements, had some success prior, uh, prior to finding my, my partner, you know, God, God in, in, in my life. And I think when you really, 
uh, can harness that, that you were created for a specific purpose. And then for me, it's all about can taking control of this physical, like, you know, as a fitness guy, like we were given this one vessel, this one body to experience this life. in. so, so it takes a combination of partnering with God in your purpose and then controlling your half of it, which is your vessel. And when you combine those two together, you can ultimately create this superhuman life. Mm. Um, so the question is, and you can, you can answer this in any way, any way you possibly want to. Um, how does Rob define a superhuman life? Hmm. I, I guess I would define a superhuman life by just achieving everything that God put me on this earth to do. Like, I don't want to leave anything on the table. I want to, I want to see what my limit is, you know, like, I don't know. I, I, I do. Be, I was, I believe in that verse where it says, you know, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be thrown in the sea. I think God meant that literal. I mean, mm-hmm. Jesus meant it literal when he said that. I think, you know, if you believe in something so much that you could literally, you know, that mountain would have slid into a sea. Now people, geologists would have explained that it was some plates under the ground shifted or something, but you would have known that it was because of your faith. So I'm believing God for some really huge things. Um, and I, you know, whether they happen or not, I just, I, I want to, I don't want to leave any blessings on the table. So I guess that would be just doing everything that he has me on this earth to do. And it could be, and, and nothing more, you know, it might not be anything as big and audacious as I I'm asking for, but as long as I don't leave anything on the table, that to me would be a superhuman life. Incredible. I, I, I have a mentor and uh, he has this, he has this kind of way of framing, you know, uh, what you just said there, like for him, heaven is, uh, is dying, meeting God and standing there is the person that you potentially could be. So we all have this potential version of what we're capable of, of, of all that we can achieve. And for him, heaven is, is showing up and meeting that person and being identical twins. Wow. And hell is showing up me that person and not having any clue and recognizing yeah, who he man. is. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> no, I heard somebody say that. He said, you know, when you hear about hell and they say there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I think it was Andy Stanley talked about it. He said, gnashing of teeth. When you think about somebody when they're, it's intense regret. And they go, oh, mm. you know, they're like gnashing their teeth. I imagine that what you're saying, imagine meeting the person that you could have been and you're, you gnash your teeth. recognize them. It's intense regret because you realize how much you let, how much you missed out on, how much you left on the table. So I love that, man. I, I, I love that idea of meeting that person and knowing, man, I left it all in the field. Yeah. You, know? you, you are my identical twin guys. You heard it here waiting before marriage for everybody, the, the value in it, pick up the book, check Rob out, get tapped in the city fam, build community, build connection, build service, change your life, make an impact. Guys, that's all what we're about doing here. And if you're, if you're part of this community, if you're part of this tribe, then you resonated with so much of this today. So we just want to thank you again for tuning in. Uh, as we ask at the every single show, uh, how you can help in, and support us grow. You know, we don't, we don't monetize. We don't, we don't make any money off of this. Uh, because it's purely behind and driven by our mission. So how can you help support us? Share it with as many people as possible. Somebody in your life needs to hear this. I know that no matter who you are. Actually, there's probably dozens of people in your life, Uh, but share it with all of them. And then if you want to help us grow, you want to help us get in front of more people, get in front of more ears, uh, leave us a rating and five-star review on whatever podcast platform you are listening to. But Rob, brother, I appreciate you so much, man. Um, Super, super excited. For Frank Rich, Rob Kowalski of City Fam. God bless you all. We'll see you next week.